my great pleasure to welcome our cyber series lecturer today, Dr. James Murrow. Uh, James did his residency training here at Mount Sinai, then joined the faculty, and is now director of the Depression Anxiety Center, and has done a fabulous job in building uh, clinical research uh, in depression, which is very much anchored in the foundation of basic neuroscience, uh, which you'll hear about uh, during his talk today. So James, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me. And uh, thank you to everyone for this opportunity and, and, and Eric for your support and mentorship over the years. I'm really excited to share this data with, with everybody. Uh, it's really the first time I think um, we've had an opportunity to share it. And as Eric alluded to, I think it's a really nice um, set of data that illustrates um, translation from research labs at Mount Sinai in neuroscience to uh, clinical studies. So let me, um, share. So the title of my talk is Developing KCNQ Channel Openers as Novel Antidepressants from Bench to Bedside. Apology, that is a bit of, of, a, of a mouthful. Uh, these are my disclosures. I do some consulting um, for um, biotech or pharmaceutical. Um, and probably the most relevant is um, we have filed a patent through Mount Sinai, as you can see down here, that's related to the, this a topic, which is um, KCNQ channel modulators for depression. If you have no idea what a KCNQ channel is, um, I didn't either a few years ago, so don't worry. Um, we're going to get into all that. And I, I've tried to make the talk so that I don't assume <clears throat> anything, uh, whether members of the audience are, are, are more clinical or clinical research or, or basic. So here's the outline. I'm uh, going to give some background and context. I want to spend a few minutes talking about a couple of things that I think will frame, hopefully, uh, your understanding of the research I'm going to show you, the clinical trial in particular, because um, we get a lot of questions about this. So I'm going to introduce, for those of you not familiar, briefly the concept of the um, RDOC. Uh, system at NIH, as well as the NIMH Translational Therapeutics Program. Then I'll talk about specifically getting into summarizing a little bit of the rationale for going after this new target for depression um, and anhedonia. Um, the third part of the talk will be to present to you new uh, as yet unpublished data from a recent uh, clinical trial, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up. So the background is, you know, this is the disease we're trying to uh, address. Um, depression dwarfs all other sort of brain-based disorders when you look at um, li uh, years lived with disability. So you see the, the curve in the light blue is depression and then um, some of the other um, psychiatric illnesses as well as neurological substance use uh, are, are all dwarfed compared to depression. And depression is right up there across all medical conditions with um, a disability. Uh, so we have a, a big problem on our hands, as, as most of you know. I like this slide, this graphic. Um, I think it sets the stage for um, how I want to try to explain our approach here. We know that depression is extremely heterogeneous at the sort of clinical symptom level and, and no doubt the neurobiological level. So this is just an example. There is this core of sort of depressed mood, um, but then there are multiple other areas that likely have their own sort of um, phenomenology, uh, maybe genetics and, 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 and biological um, abnormalities. Uh, for the non-clinicians in the audience, just to remind you, this is how we make the clinical diagnosis. This is, this is DSM. So the patient has to have depressed mood nearly every day, most of the day, um, or diminishedly, di markedly diminished um, interest or pleasure in all or almost all activities most of the day, nearly every day. That's verbatim from the DSM, so you get a sense of um, how this book uh, is written. You have to have one of those, the second one being generally what we refer to as anhedonia. So you have to have depressed mood or anhedonia, and then uh, at least four of these other um, symptoms. So many of you are probably familiar, the RDOC approach is sort of, um, was developed a number of years ago now to sort of be uh, an alternative to try and encourage investigators um, in, particularly in human research, to move away from using the DSM as their uh, starting point. So now instead of studying depression, 
the NIMH asks investigators to submit proposals where we're studying one of these constructs, essentially. Uh, and so you can see the lower left, uh, the table there, um, the different constructs are organized into five uh, domains, such as negative valence, positive valence, cognitive systems, et cetera. Uh, each domain then has multiple constructs. So there's a construct of acute threat or under positive valence um, motivation. And then you can unpack this and each of the, many of these have sort of sub constructs within them. Uh, on the right, you see the primary domains listed again and illustrating that the idea is that this is mapped, that each of these systems can be defined or characterized at multiple levels. You see sort of circuits there in the middle and then you have self reports on one hand and then molecules and genes on the other. So this is, this is the RDoC framework that the uh, study I'm gonna tell you about uh, was, was sort of um, uh, uh, based on. And um, many people in the field have focused on anhedonia, okay, as a, uh, or, or in, in, in our doc terminology, we would talk about the positive valence system. But, but really what we're talking about is anhedonia being a core symptom of depression. So it's, it's close to the disease of interest. And yet, you know, arguably it, it, it sort of, it's more specific, right? It's specifically lack of response to pleasure. It maps nicely to some of the RDoC domains. Um, it has behavioral endpoints that facilitate translational research between human and clinical. There's a, a relatively well-developed functional neuroanatomy of the reward system that we understand largely from um, uh, rodent work, also, also primate. Um, but then in humans, we also have uh, relatively robust ways to measure the function of these systems in human brain with techniques like um, functional uh, imaging. So it's kind of, uh, I think, researchers within sort of the mood disorder spectrum um, uh, largely pivoted to focus on anhedonia um, within sort of an RDoC um, uh, framework. And, and we were no exception to that. I'll just take a minute here to describe a little more the use of functional MR to look at this reward system because um, this actually was our primary endpoint for the clinical trial we recently com uh, completed that I want to tell you about. So for those of you not familiar, the way a functional MRI task works in humans, the individuals lying in the scanner, on the left, you see a schematic of a task and where the individual is viewing uh, images on the screen and making responses with, uh, by pushing buttons. This is called the incentive flanker task. It's a variant of a well-established task called the monetary incentive delay. So let me briefly uh, describe it for you. There's three trial types, uh, gain, neutral, and loss. Um, for this talk, we're only going to be focusing on the gain and the neutral. And each okay. trial type has three phases. There's expectancy, then the individual makes a response, and then there's feedback. So at the expectancy stage, I'll show you here, um, the individual is told, if you perform correctly on the task, you're going to win money, 50 cents on this trial. Uh, and then they go on, um, if you move from left to right on the screen on that uh, image, uh, they have to make a task here. This is a flanker task where they need to determine if the target is congruent or incongruent. Uh, the details don't matter, but they know that if they get it right, they could win something. And then there's finally the feedback part that says, correct, you won, okay? Um, and then right the, the uh, line right below it shows that's neutral where they're just told, you know what, nothing's gonna happen, whatever you do. So for all the data I'm gonna show you, the, the key here is we take the expectancy, that's thought to measure sort of what we call reward anticipation. There's many aspects of reward um, anticipation. There's sort of consumption. So you could model differences in feedback. Did the brain respond when someone has actually told you one? Uh, but a lot of data suggests that in depression, it's the anticipation of reward that may be dysfunctional. So here we focus on the expectancy column and we're always gonna be comparing the brain response with the bold signal during gain compared to neutral. Okay, so on the right, what does this look like? This is just a, a, a heuristic image uh, example from Haber and Knudsen, uh, looking at the bold signal in this gain over neutral contrast during reward anticipation at three levels of the brain that uh, we uh, know are critical nodes in the reward circuit. I'm starting most eventually, you have the VTA of course, then the NAC or ventral striatum, and then you have nodes in, in medial frontal or ventral uh, uh, frontal. So this is the form of the data that we're sort of asked 
to, to use instead of, for example, clinical rating scales, primarily to understand the effects of a drug. During the talk, I'll probably refer to the NAC and the ventral striatum um, interchangeably. So, so I've told you a little bit about RDOC and a little bit about fMRI methods of measuring circuits in humans. This is language right from the NIMH website. The, the other thing I wanna tell you guys about is what they call it's the NIMH Translational Therapeutics Program. Uh, I put some bullets here from the website, but again, it orients you, it says, um, so first they told us don't study depression, study a construct. And then they said, don't do a regular clinical trial with clinical endpoints. We're more interested in proof of mechanism. And, and I won't go through this, you can read here, but they're her, encouraging or, or largely requiring uh, applications for clinical trials to have as their primary endpoint, some type of surrogate marker of what they call target engagement or mechanism. Um, and so that's that, that sort of, drove much of the design. Um, when we were designing this, these first studies of um, whether drugs that affected the KCNQ channel might be um, novel antidepressants, um, this, this, this new approach was <clears throat> taking hold. Uh, the study by Crystal that we were collaborator on, collaborators on uh, was sort of the flagship approach. This was actually a contract commissioned by NIMH to sort of demonstrate to the field how they wanted this research done. Much of the features of the clinical trial of Izogabine I'm gonna tell you about were borrowed um, from really this protocol. So I wanted to take a moment to tell you about this study and the results of which were just published and, and describe for you briefly what we saw in that study. So this was a, a description, if, for those of you interested in Nature Reviews Drug Discovery, a brief description of this approach that is largely what I reviewed for you before that has RDOC components and um, translational therapeutic components. But here the authors um, talk about uh, in sort of order of drug discovery, we have to find a biomarker that reflects the activity of the experimental compound. So in our case, we think that a functional measure of the reward circuit may be a relevant reflection of the activity of uh, something that targets this channel. And when I show you the basic science, hopefully you'll agree with that. We use this biomarker to determine if the drug affects the target, perhaps assist in dose selection. Um, and then that then sets the stage for sort of later phase testing and more classic studies. So this, this was the actual, the results of the paper published in Nature Medicine uh, last year as sort of the first published, uh, say, I guess, example of this new breed of clinical trials. Um, so I have a slide for you on kind of what the design was and then the findings. Like I say, it's, it's quite relevant to what the study ultimately we designed. So here in the top panel, this is the study flow. You have screening, there's baseline. At baseline, individuals undergo clinical assessments with classic depression measures like the HAMD. Um, in our study, we use the MADRAS. These are sort of classic um, uh, uh, scales that give you a total severity score the HAMD and the MADRAS are probably the most commonly used in clinical trials. They're recognized by the FDA and encouraged to be used in registration trials for approving um, antidepressants uh, for, for marketing. Um, the SHAPS is uh, a, a self-report of the experience of pleasure. And the field has largely coalesced around this as a self-report sort of at the clinical level of anhedonia, okay? Uh, so you see, can see here that SHAPS is measured throughout an eight-week trial. MRI is done at baseline um, and then an outcome, as well as a number of other behavioral tasks, EEG, which I'm not going to get into. On the bottom, you see the way that uh, Crystal described the MID task. Hopefully, it looks familiar to you based on what I described before. Um, so you see there's a reward queue, a target, and feedback. Then you have loss versions, and then you have no incentive. And so... Uh, if you remember, the contrasts of interest are the reward anticipation versus no incentive. So where in the brain is there more activity in this versus that condition? Um, and here are the results. On the left, this shows you the map where the red is the region of interest. So imagine it's a mask. So you only put this region that corresponds to the anatomy we care about. This is the ventral striatum. This is the exact same mask we used for the study I'm going to tell you about you extract the signal and you see the primary outcome of the study. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I, I should mention, 
the compound that was selected to be used was a kappa opiate um, antagonist, okay? And the point of the talk is not to get into that or talk about the opiate system, but um, here it was thought to be a promising strategy of blocking kappa signaling um, to improve mood and motivation and that this intervention should act at the level of the accumbens or the striatum and increase activity. So the, the concept is the same uh, as with uh, KCNQ, which you'll see in a moment. So you see the values for placebo and the drug at baseline on the, on the right, and then at outcome where there's a significant advantage of the drug in terms of the activation to brain to reward, um, the standardized effect is just about a little over half a standard deviation, 0.85, not a bad effect. Uh, I point that out because you'll see we get a strikingly similar sized effect in our trial. So with all that as background, let me now pivot to the, the topic of the talk, which is our sort of, which is the KCNQ channels and start with a little bit of the, of the rationale. I would um, I would not begin to try to explain the social defeat model to this audience. Um, you guys are always trying to explain it to me, but in case there's someone out there that's not uh, familiar, this is a validated stress model of uh, depression wherein um, a mouse, uh, a target mouse is exposed to an aggressor uh, for a period of time each day, day after day for classically uh, 10 days. And then that um, target mouse can, um, viewed in one way exhibit either a defeated phenotype, which is characterized as you see here by social avoidance. Thank you, Minghu, for the slide. Anhedonic-like symptoms, okay, for example, in sucrose preference, uh, classic pro-depressive uh, behaviors in, in forced swim. Um, but then you have another group of mice that actually show resistance to this phenotype or, or, or resilience. Um, and you'll see in a minute, this becomes important for uh, how uh, how the KCNQ channel was identified. This is from Krishnan uh, et al. and Cell and way back in 2007. There's been a lot of research since then, but but briefly, and um, I understand this this finding has in some ways um, held up in in different experiments. But the the defeated mice do show show abnormalities within this VTA2 nucleus accumbens projection, particularly actually tonic um, overactivity. And that's indicated uh, on the left, for example, in this uh, these uh, projections of D2 containing neurons to accumbens um, in the susceptible mice, whereas in the resilient or resistant, uh, their circuit appears normal. And one of the apparently molecular adaptations, which seems key for driving that, is in the resilient animals, they upregulated, increased the uh, number and a function of uh, their potassium channels, right? Which in the VTA, which tends to normalize neuronal firing, thought to bring it into baseline. You can see the artistic representation of that uh, on the right, where you have social defeat. You have the hyperactive VTA neurons with low levels of potassium channel function in the vulnerable, depressed, and this is the resistant. So the insight from, from Minghu's group and others was that um, in the next study, what if you could pharmacologically enhance that channel uh, in the defeated animals? Um, could you rescue the phenotype? Would it be antidepressant? Could you essentially mimic a natural endogenous pro-resilience mechanism with a drug? Uh, so this was from Minghu's group uh, with um, Allison Friedman as the, as, the, as the lead author. And it, it, it appeared that, that that was the case. I won't go through um, uh, in detail, but they um, tested a number of KCNQ channel openers, activators, okay, um, uh, and focused in on one in particular that is known as ritigabine um, in Europe or isogabine in the U.S. So here you'll see this indicated as ritigabine. For those of you familiar with looking at these uh, heat maps, um, these experiments showed that in defeated animals that were treated with uh, isogabine a daily, importantly peripherally, uh, but they also show this with direct uh, infusion into brain, into VTA, um, they were basically able to reverse this and this showed um, antidepressant activity and some evidence for normalization of the neuronal um, activity as well. So this was very exciting obviously to us and in our um, depression club 
way back years ago now with the Minghu coming out, coming to us and Eric and saying, you guys should figure out a way to test this uh, in, in people. And that's um, part of why I'm excited to share with you this work today, because this, this is sort of uh, where we are with this. Um, let me just tell you briefly, uh, so what is this? I've been referring to these KCNQ channels. Uh, this is one of these things, there's a couple different nomenclatures. KV7 is a synonym for KCNQ. Um, now the KV family in general is the largest family of voltage-gated potassium channels encoded by the genome. They, they contain these um, six transmembrane uh, domains. Uh, there's 12 subfamilies. We're talking about the KV7 subfamily which is primarily expressed in, in, in CNS uh, and peripheral uh, nervous system, it has five members, uh, KV71 through 75, which corresponds to the KCNQ1 uh, through five. It's been known for years that these um, channels played a key role in controlling membrane excitability. They've been uh, the focus of drug discovery for CNS disorders of different type, pain, seizure, et cetera, for, um, like literally a couple of decades. You'll see me refer to uh, throughout the talk KCNQ2 slash three, as you see, see there, these channels form uh, heteromultimers and typically two and three um, uh, functionally act uh, uh, together. Um, and uh, that's what we think essentially is the, is the target of the interventions um, we're gonna be uh, talking about. This is just an example. This was a, from a, a number of years ago from Nature Reviews Drug Discovery on a focused on the, um, the KV7 uh, family and different molecules that are either inhibitors, as you can see, or activators. So here again is ritigabine. So ritigabine was the first, I, I believe it was the first KV7 activator uh, characterized, if, if, if I understand that right, uh, primarily in seizure models and, and ultimately was brought uh, to market um, for seizure disorder. So this is the drug, uh, was marketed as Potiga, was first approved in the US um, in 2011 as a first in class KCNQ channel opener, meaning it worked mechanistically different than any other uh, anti-epileptic drug on the market um, uh, uh, previously. Uh, those drugs typically uh, affected um, and reduced glutamate signaling or perhaps enhanced GABA but this was the first that worked on these uh, KV7 um, channels. The, uh, this drug was studied in just over 1,200 adults uh, with refractory seizures at the doses you see there, 6, 12, 9. You'll see that we selected 900 milligrams to use in our trial. Um, by the time you got to 1,200 milligrams a day, th there was quite a bit of uh, side effect burden for patients. Sedation was quite common, um, confusion, particularly at the 1200 milligrams. Um, and if you looked at efficacy on seizures, uh, the nine and the 12 appeared similar. So we were confident that the 900 milligrams sort of got into brain and was having activity at these channels. Um, and so we, we, that was the dose we, we selected for our initial uh, study. I will mention that, I don't know, for the, those of you who may not know, but I guess spoil in the end, you can't get isogabine anymore. You can't prescribe it. You know, if you're uh, uh, trying to treat someone's seizure, um, early on the FDA issued a warning that that, that um, changes in pigment uh, in the retina was being observed that uh, raised concern about the possibility of, of vision loss with long-term treatment. Uh, so it got a black box warning and the, um, Clinical use of the drug never really took off and it was ultimately withdrawn. Uh, I will say that it was withdrawn right around when we got the notice of the award for this grant. Uh, and thank you to Ivy Cohen if you're out there. She's the director of the Investigational Drug Service at Mount Sinai, which we couldn't do any of this work without. And working together, we were able to basically purchase all of the azogabine um, I think we, that basically was in the US and we stored it at Mount Sinai and just stockpile so we could do the clinical trial that I'm um, gonna share with you. Uh, so this was the study that was funded by the NIMH based on the preclinic work I described as sort of a RDOC, a translational therapeutics 
approach to try to do an initial test of the hypothesis that KCNQ channel um, uh, may be a, a target in depression. This was a phase 2A, you could call it a 1B design, probably randomized parallel arm double blind trial. Uh, the primary objective stated in the protocol was to establish target engagement of a KCNQ channel opener in patients with depression and anhedonia, secondarily to determine if the drug was associated with improvements in symptoms of depression. The uh, enrollment plan called to randomize 48 adults. Um, uh, this was a two-site study. I should mention we were the lead site here at Mount Sinai. My close colleague, Sanjay Matthew, was the site PI at Baylor. Uh, and they worked their butts off to enroll for this. So um, very uh, happy to uh, um, acknowledge uh, Sanjay that really helped get this work done. The duration of the study is five weeks. And you might be thinking, well, depression studies are typically at least eight weeks. Um, but actually, it was really meant to be one week. So remember, this was just, did the drug affect the brain target or not? That was really the, the primary objective. The drug is, um, it requires a slow titration because of sedation. It's a TID three times a day drug. It has relatively unfavorable kinetics. So it took, it's a four week titration to get to 900 milligrams. So our logic was we thought patients should be on the drug for at least a week before we re-image their brain. Why a week? I'm not, I couldn't tell you, probably arbitrary. Um, so that's how we got to the five weeks. So that's just to say, that shows you how little we were worried about, I mean, in retrospect, you know, trying to measure a clinical effect because we were only giving people one week uh, on, on drug. Primary endpoint, as I've um, hopefully comes as no surprise based on the, the uh, background I provided is change in activation in ventral striatum from baseline to end of treatment as measured with fMRI and the incentive flanker task, secondary and safety evaluations we've, we've discussed. And we were powered to see a relatively large effect at a two-tailed uh, P.05 level using a mixed model um, analysis. Who could get in the trial? Men and women, 18 to 65, pretty standard. Um, they had to have depression. Um, we allowed them to have like dysthymia or what the DSM-5 uncreatively refers to as other depressive disorder. This was our sort of not so creative attempt to make it more transdiagnostic. We said, yeah, they have to have depression, but it doesn't have to be MDD. They do have to have clinically significant anxiety, uh, anhedonia is defined by a shaps of at least 20. They have to have a CGI of four. So this is a global clinical impression scale been around forever, one to seven. Seven is the most severe patient you've ever seen. A four is considered moderately ill, sort of appropriate for treatment or clinical trial. So they did have to have a four, they did have to be ill Importantly, they couldn't actually be on any other treatments. They couldn't be on antidepressants. So these patients were not treated, otherwise treated uh, in the, in the, to be in the, in the study. Uh, and you, you can see the other criteria there. This is the, the design quite similar to the, the fast mass design I showed you from Crystal et al, where there was imaging and clinical at baseline and then outcome. Uh, we had five weeks and we measured their clinical symptoms with the Shaps and Madras um, at each uh, week. We assessed 70 patients for eligibility. We ended up randomizing 45. We sort of, we randomized until we basically ran out of drug or the last lot of the drug expired. Uh, so we got to 45, a little shy of our goal of 48. You can see that 21 ended up in the ESO arm, uh, 24 ended up in placebo, and we had a pretty nice retention rate of 95 and 92% with a few uh, loss to follow up. <clears throat> uh, so these are the characteristics of the individuals in the trial. Um, it was largely half and half, uh, men and women, uh, um, late, late, late 30s, uh, early 40s, uh, about half Caucasian, uh, uh, almost a third um, uh, Hispanic, um, largely thanks to the Baylor site in Houston. Uh, mostly had some college um, education and about half and half were um, employed. In terms of baseline clinical characteristics, so you can see there, you know, over 90% of the sample met criteria for MDD. Um, 
and you see their baseline depression severity scores, a MADRAS score of, um, you know, high 20s, 30, that's again, sort of moderately severe. You can see the shafts. You remember we required it to be at least a 20. Uh, so um, they're both groups are well above that. Uh, interestingly, uh, just by random, random chance, um, higher shaft scores in the azogabine group. They both have between a four and a five severity. Um, interestingly, if you look at comorbid disorder, uh, about a third of the sample met current criteria for PTSD. And we allowed that as long as it wasn't judged to be the primary presenting clinical problem. And almost half the sample had met current a GAD. This is the adverse events data. Uh, if you look here, so these are the total number of events reported in the trial, not number of patients. And then we have here our DSMB asked us this, this is number of events per 100 patient months. But uh, if you look down here, dizziness was highly overrepresented in the isogabine versus the placebo group. Um, and otherwise really not, not too much, quite fairly well tolerated. Fortunately, there were no serious adverse events or, or deaths in the trial or treatment emergent suicidal behavior. Okay, so fine, get, I'll get on with all that. What did we find? <laughs> so yeah, uh, the drug actually, I, depending on your perspective, it did what we thought it would do, okay? It, um, you remember the task on the left, I already showed that. So if you look on the right, this is just to remind you, this was the region of interest. We extracted and plotted the activation under the two conditions on uh, the panel on the right is ogabine and placebo. This is change <clears throat> at outcome compared to baseline. So the, the, the positive numbers indicate uh, more activity following treatment than at baseline. So you can see the ogabine group went up, which is what we expected. The placebo group stayed about the same, decreased a little bit and overall that difference um, was actually not statistically significant. It was P.07 and our threshold was 0.05. So you can imagine the discussions we had with the editors and the reviewers at the American Journal, where fortunately it's now accepted in press, where we had to declare that our primary endpoint was not met. If you look at the Cohen's D, I don't know if it's a fluke, that's, that's uh, remember that standard deviation units, that's almost identical to what Crystal had. Uh, their paper had uh, about 100 patients. So it was about doubled in size. Um, and for the statistical aficionados out there, I looked more closely. They tested their hypothesis on the ventral stridum activity with a one-tailed t-test. So basically, um, yeah, if we had done a one-tailed test, this would also be significant. Anyways, it's a discussion for another time. But uh, numerically, it went in the hypothesized direction with this little uh, inconvenient wrinkle that it did not uh, exceed a uh, predefined uh, threshold. Let's look at the clinical. I would say this is what uh, certainly everyone on the study team was sort of scratching their heads trying to um, understand this because it was not expected. But we saw large and consistent changes across basic, almost all of our clinical measures favoring isogabine over a very short time period. This is the madras. So I'm showing here on the left, the mean change from baseline. Uh, you could see isogabine in the purple, placebo in the orange <clears throat> by week, just to orient you. So let's start with the placebo. The placebo group immediately from randomization. So here, this is negative. So neg this is improvement. This is <laughs> reduced score. So on the madras, zero to 60, higher scores, more depressed. So you want to bring it down. So this is a typical way of showing this type of change data. Um, change from baseline for each individual means um, with variance around the estimate of the mean. Um, in general, we expect, um, we'd like to see placebo, placebo always improves. We'd like to see that improvement limited to somewhere between five and 10 points. You'd rather it was five, some studies, it was closer to 10. Here, it was getting close to 10. Uh, generally, the feeling in the field is if you have a placebo response greater than 10, you're probably in trouble. Uh, here, we had a, a 
a, a rapid and large separation of the azogabine group starting early in the titration all the way through to uh, exceeding a 15 point improvement. This absolute difference was, I mean, if you just look at it, I guess it was greater than five points. That's a very large difference. That's uh, along the order of slightly more than, for example, the average difference in MADRA scores in the FDA registration trials for the uh, for esketamine. Um, the quids is a self-report, also gives you general depression. So if you look on the right, the curve's not quite as nice, but I think it makes the point. So the MADRA is clinician rated, blinded clinicians. The quids is the self-report. So it likewise... Um, is congruent. Let's look at the anhedonia measures. So first up is the shaps on the left uh, here. Interestingly, the, this is a self-report. The self-report of pleasure <clears throat> and similar where higher scores is, is worse, just like the madras, okay? So you'd like to see those increasing negative numbers. The self-report of the improvement of pleasure was almost flat in placebo, interestingly. Whereas in isogabine, there was a large and early separation and a very large difference here um, with a Cohen's D of 0.6. We had a couple other measures. <clears throat> One is the temporal experience of pleasure scale. This has the advantage of disentangling. It has a subscale for anticipation. You, you, you remember the anticipation in the consumption phases of the task. Uh, we think that the anticipation of pleasure is what's dysfunctional primarily in depression. Um, so what you're seeing here, this is the anticipation score of the TEPs. Now it's flipped. So with the TEPs, the higher the score, the more they enjoy or the more anticipatory pleasure they experience. So likewise here, uh, you see a similar effect where a relatively large increase in under drug versus placebo. Um, and th this is, this is um, highly exploratory, but we took that report of anticipatory pleasure and we asked, so does an, in, does an individual self-report of their ability to anticipate, pet, anticipate pleasure correlate with the activation in their nucleus accumbens during the anticipation of pleasure in the task? And um, it, it did, um, uh, it's a small sample there, uh, but there was a hint that there may actually be a link between our brain measure activation and our self um, report. So let me sort of summarize for you what we saw in this uh, trial. <clears throat> so this was a two site RCT target engagement study, which we were able to successfully complete at a, reaching about 94% of our target enrollment. Isogamine was well tolerated. Um, the hypothesized effect was observed on the target, but it did not exceed the uh, statistical threshold that we predetermined. And there was sort of a surprisingly robust effect of the drug across uh, most, but I should say not all the clinical uh, endpoints, which was secondary. This is just a screenshot of the paper that I mentioned um, is in press at the American Journal. You can see this was a, a large, uh, large effort. I'm always amazed when you start putting all the authors on how there could be so many. A special thanks to Sarah Costi, uh, who really was the tip of the spear in, in um, the clinical aspect of the patient, Laurel, uh, getting the patients in, Laurel Morris, who really uh, supervised and drove uh, uh, the uh, imaging analysis and to Sanjay's uh, group and many others that, that helped us. Um, so let me just wrap up and I'm delighted that I'm just exactly on time. Hopefully we have plenty of time for discussion and, and questions. Uh, so I guess I'll, 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 I'll um, if you'll indulge me to state the KCNQ channel hypothesis of depression, it would simply be that patients with depression have a deficient, have deficient signaling at the KCNQ23 channel um, within the reward system in particular, perhaps. Uh, and then enhancing signaling at this channel will improve symptoms of depression, uh, perhaps primarily uh, anhedonia. Um, so as I mentioned, is Ogabine inconveniently for us was withdrawn from the market in 2017, right around, around when we started the trial. For those of you familiar with this, um, the extramural uh, instantiation of the therapeutics program I described, they fund these conglomerated two 
study things of R61s, R33s. Um, the R33 provides an additional three years of funding to essentially try to confirm what you found. Um, and we had a we've had we had spirited <clears throat> discussions with program over the last 12 months if they would wish to, to fund this, um, particularly since the drug we used was no longer available. Uh, so we we were um, we found out they will would like to fund this. Uh, so we're excited about that. So we're uh, preparing to start. Uh, a follow-up study that is going to use a brand new novel KCNQ opener that is not available on the market, but we were able to partner with a, a, a company uh, who has developed this drug that's they're developing it, that's in phase two for seizures, and they've seen seen uh, it, it seen to it that um, they would like to collaborate with us to um, provide us with the drug so we can carry this research forward. <clears throat> It'll be very interesting to see if we see similar clinical or neural effects with a different compound with the same uh, target. And you know, based on what we know, we think that the new drug is perhaps more selective and more potent at the target of interest. And it's a once daily dosing with improved uh, PK. So we're excited to be um, starting that uh, soon. Let me just have a, a conclude here. That's my last slide. So um, based on the talk I, I've given you today, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that um, mechanistically uh, novel treatments for depression are urgently needed. That basic research indicates that enhancing signal and KCNQ channels within the reward circuit may be pro-resilient and antidepressant. That experimental medicine or sort of these proof of, proof of mechanism, proof of concept human studies are thought to hold particular potential to translate insights from basic research into clinical development programs as a step to actually get them picked up and moved towards market by, again, companies, probably not by universities. Um, Isogamine, a first in human KCNQ channel opener, provides the first proof of concept test of the KCNQ channel hypothesis of depression. And hopefully you'll agree with me that future research uh, is warranted in this in this area. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the team. You saw the the list of people I listed on the publication. This is our uh, depression center at um, at Mount Sinai. I mentioned again, particularly Laurel and Sarah for this, and and to um, Eric and Ming Hu for really providing the preclinical rationale and really encouraging us uh, at every step. Uh, I should say shout out since this is the Friedman Brain Institute lecture that um, we received initial funds to do an initial pilot. And I, just to save you all the time, I didn't even get into it, but we, the Friedman Brain Institute funded a open small pilot study of isogabine, um, which allowed us to then get the grant to do the placebo controlled trial. So this was very much a, a baby of the FBI, I think. And um, thanks for your attention um, and happy to take questions. Thanks so much, James, that was great. Uh, please unshare your screen and that way we can all look at each other. We do have lots of time for questions. So I would encourage people to unmute themselves and speak up. You know, James, one of the, um, I hadn't seen the Crystal Potter paper in Nature Medicine, so thanks for pointing that out. I think it's uh, useful to emphasize that that mechanism also, the kappa opioid antagonist mechanism, also came out straight from basic neuroscience. So it's another example right. of a rational drug design in the depression space. And so it's so gratifying to see that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, guys, so don't be bashful. Any questions? Uh, James? Hey, uh, Miku. Great talk. Hey, thank uh, you. So I saw you uh, listed the side effect. Uh, so the, the vision blur. So you have three patients. 
do you see any, you know, kind of a retina color change or nail color changes? Uh, yeah, so we, we didn't. So I don't know if I said it, but the FDA um, <clears throat> required that we do, we had ophthalmologic exams at baseline and, and endpoint. Yeah. And so to, uh, to pick up whether we were seeing, we didn't think we would because the worry and the changes that were observed as part of the, um, like a phase four surveillance mm. program, you know, that the FDA has when a new drug comes to market, they they sort of say, okay, now that we're treating many, many, many more people, we expect new problems. So that's how they picked up the retinal change. Those were only in, in individuals with, you know, refractory chronic seizure disorder. And, you know, for those types of disorders, you stay on the drugs. I mean, you don't. Um, and so that was after, I think, like, you know, a year plus of treatment. So we didn't expect to see anything in five weeks. Yeah. Um, and we looked and, 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 and we didn't. And uh, uh, the, our industry partner believes that their compound, there's something about it, it, it I don't know, it, 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 isogabine dimerizes and that, that there's something that there's some process that doesn't happen with the new one. But yes. um, the FDA already told us we have to do eye exams anyways. Yeah. They take um, off the uh, light sensitive part. Okay, right. Yep. Yep. And nobody turned blue, which I didn't mention that, but that's also in the black box warning. Right. Hi, James. Uh, this is Anne. It's a great talk and congratulations on the publication. Oh, I thank just you. Noticed, I just noticed in the, um, in the FMI task, you didn't look at the contrast between the loss and new shock. Um, you know, in the monetary task, you always specify the loss uh, version. So what's your speculation on that? In terms of the job, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, so um, we, we didn't have a hypothesis about it because um, we just, it would be hard to, we thought it would be hard to interpret and we specifically did not, we didn't include that in our analytic plan because we didn't want people to sort of, you know, let's say we, um, start specifying a lot of different analyses we would do, then there would be um, typically in clinical trials there, they sort of hold our feet to the fire in terms of correcting for multiple comparisons. B but that being said, um, we are, um, now that that paper is like out, we're gonna go back and do a more, what will, you know, sort of an exploratory analysis to look at all the contrasts, um, wow. you know, um, and I would have to go back to the literature to see there's much less published, but what has been published, I think something's been published about how about the response of the reward system under loss conditions um, and mm -hmm. in disorders, but I would actually have to refresh my memory, but we should do that before we do the analysis so we can write down a couple of hypotheses. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm, I'm not sure what we would expect. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing your update on that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, James, this is Harry. Um, Hi, Harry. The, um, what happens to non-dopaminergic systems? Do you know? Uh, no, I mean, I don't. Now, presumably, you know, all the work, there's a lot of preclinical work in uh, models of epilepsy, which was really the driver of this, I mean, this was the focus of this compound in drug development. Um, and, you know, we could go back and look, but certainly those models, they were looking at the ability of the drug to reduce a membrane excitability in, um, you know, cortex, right? In, in cortical cells, uh, hippocampal cells. Um, so, you know, I mean, one question is the, and, and what additional preclinical work would we need to do to sort of help determine maybe the specificity of the effect? Because re if we regulate KC and Q channels, that'll have effects throughout the CNS. Um, but that's what I was, I was kind of getting at in terms of understanding what the broader implications of uh, the drugs might be. I, I, absolutely. I can tell you with the the human stuff, there was a study with Izogabine 
as well as the new compound that we're going to use that uses like a human um, assay for cortical excitability for uh, epilepsy, which has which is um, using TMS to excite motor cortex. Um, and they can measure the threshold of, of electrical input needed to stimulate, for example, um, the um, like a thumb twitch. Uh, and oh. then that's sort of an assay where they can um, test doses of anti-epileptic drugs. So we know that both isogabine and other KCNQ openers uh, raises the threshold in pyramidal motor neuron excitability, for sure. So we, we it, this drug does have effects throughout the cortex. Um, what that contribution is to its antidepressant effects, right? Right. Uh, right. You know, uh, we don't know. Um, the story I told you in the study and the way we designed it was very, you know, blinders on, right? We're looking at a specific circuit, a specific region. And part of that was driven by, there's so much worry about, about fishing that we, that our, even if we wanted to, our DSMB would not allow us to look anywhere in the brain, except they said, pick one region. So I think there's a lot more to learn. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm personally a huge proponent of fishing, but. Oh. <laughs> the art of fishing. Are you, James, are you not able, to, aside from the study now, after the study, take a look at the functional and oh, uh, absolutely. Look at other regions yes. of interest? Underway. Yeah, absolutely. We just couldn't make it be part of the primary. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a question in chat from June Wong, uh, who asks, do you see any differences in treatment responses between male and female subjects? We looked and we did not see any differences. Mm -hmm. Yep. Other questions? If not, James, thank you again so much. Uh, I can't tell you how gratifying it is for me to see these data. Good. And uh, thank you again uh, for a great talk. Really appreciate it. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you to everyone for your attention. Take Thanks care. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.